Um, yeah, thanks. Um, so yeah, just a, just a few things that like they were mentioning, like financially, that's, your financial situation can change so quickly and you can be under the poverty line and one check away from being homeless yourself. A um, couple other things to touch on. Um, we're finding increasing numbers of women phoning us from like the correctional centers in you know by the big by PA. They're being released. Their you know probation officer has no place for them to go, or they got picked up on charges. They don't need to go to jail, but they need to have a perp, they need to have an address. And we're getting calls from the court system asking us to be that address for them. And we're like, we're a 28 day stay. Like that's not really our mandate. And, if you need them to keep this address and it's not working out for them, are you going to put them back in jail because they couldn't stay here? Um, so that's an issue. And the other thing we're running into is people will get sick, go into the hospital. They don't have somebody in their life to go and pay their rent for them. They get evicted while they're like in the hospital with pneumonia, or if they get admitted to the psych ward because they don't have somebody to pay it. Um, you know, and and Sean mentioned like a lot of times with women when their homelessness is hitting, if you know. If there are individuals who are working the street, they might be staying with a John who's violent. They might be choosing to stay in a drug house. They might be, you know, wanting to, people with addictions might be wanting to get clean, but their entire support network is still actively using. So you're looking at, you know, you're trying to help people, you know, pull themselves up and do something, but how do you help them to essentially rebuild their entire community? Because if you come from a family or a community where everybody is drinking and or doing some type of drugs or something like that, and you know you want to get clean because maybe you want to get your kids back, but you're asking them to choose between their life, their entire family, and their children, right? So it's a huge issue, and who's at risk? Like like they said, every everyone has the potential to be a risk for homelessness, and to get out of it, a lot of times it's difficult. It's hard and. When we see people that leave our shelter, their first month, because they're waiting for you know, the rental housing supplement to kick in or their employment supplement to kick in. Um, and we're going to landlords and being like, hey, can they pay your rent? But they're gonna be like a month behind for the first two months because they're gonna need to eat instead of paying all of their money to you for rent. You know, So, I mean, that's the other side of it too. Um, when we're looking at these programs, part of, a large part of it's you know, creating the community and the support for the individuals that need to get into housing. But the other side of it is to make sure that we keep in mind landlords are business owners. They're, you know, yes, there's some landlords that probably shouldn't be landlords because they're, you know, not the best at what they do. But at the end of the day, they're a business. And so whatever model we go into, it's also making sure that we're not just trying to force landlords to just fix the problem by taking people and taking a huge financial cut, right? So I think that's something else really important to keep in mind. All right, we'll take some questions from the audience now. Yeah, if anyone has questions, right? so you can just talk loudly. So one of my questions is related to the five days for the homeless. I just came from a social work class, and somebody mentioned that they are quite frustrated because they're doing their placement where they're dealing with a lot of addictions. And five days for the homeless did a fundraiser in Canada, which they said seems kind of counterintuitive when you're trying to raise awareness and money for homelessness. And many of the individuals who are being certified for Michael or HN and other resources for dealing with addictions. So how do you guys feel about that? Um, I think the thing is, is the idea behind the five days of homeless is to raise awareness, it's to raise those and start to have those conversations. Um, and I think, you know, I've been at other state nights that we've had at the Owl, right? And like I get, you know, it's, it's the campus bar and those kind of things, but I think it's, you have to look at what your intent is, right? The intent for this week and for this, this activity was to raise money to help an agency who's essentially one of the only, like, actual nine to five, Monday to Friday drop-ins for individuals who don't really have a community to go to, right? And so, I think you have to look at the intent, and the intent is to try to help, right? And so, I don't think that all of your activities have to be without what some of the issues that those people you're trying to help have, right? Um, it would be different if you like went to Carmichael and you know had a big party there with you know lots of alcohol and drugs, right? That would be counterintuitive to me. But this, it's it's about raising awareness, and and sometimes you have to try to find fun ways to raise, raise that awareness, right? So.
I've given this a uh, bit of thought, and I think uh, several things on this. One, um, there's a problem with any charity model. Whenever you're talking about giving money through charity, it's never going to solve the actual problem. There's that good analogy of the baby swimming down the river. You know, you're, you're at the beach with your friends and uh, you notice there's a baby down the river, floating down the river. Well, what do you do? Well, I'm hoping you jump in the water and save the baby. But uh, then you get back to the beach and you notice that uh, you saved this baby, you're all happy, you turn around, there's two more. So there, there are more babies down the river. And finally, you spend your whole time saving these babies. At some point, you got to look upstream where the baby's coming from, right? Um, so that's the thing with charity. You're never getting at the structural issues that actually caused the problem in the first place. So when you're feeding people at Carmichael or anywhere else, providing uh, food for somebody, you're not actually preventing the next person from eating those services. So any time you're doing a charity act, I, I think that it's still an important act, but you have it's, a, it's only one step in a two-step part where you actually also have to work on the structural issues that are causing that in the first place. And so when you do any act of charity, I think meeting people where they are, and if it happens to be the owl, even if there's a bit of a contradiction there, often many things in life have all kinds of contradictions. So uh, if the people that you want to try to get through are the owl, I think that you got to meet people where they are. And that comes with, um, same with when you're arguing with someone about whatever issue you're trying to explain to them. If you come at them with Foucault when they want to know about Carmichael, it's not going to work. Um, you got to meet people where they are and then try to raise everyone's game. And I think that um, the other part about this is I don't feel bad about giving to charity even though I know about this because you can't do Foucault on an empty belly. Um, so what, what that means is you can't do this kind of thinking. This structural analysis isn't going to happen when you're hungry. It's when your belly is full you can think about these things. So like I said, I don't feel bad about giving to charity, but consider it an incomplete act. You're, you're helping the immediate people who need food, and I would want that food if I was in the lineup. But I'd also want the people to help prevent the next person from getting in the line behind me. So um, with any, again, with any act of charity, it's an incomplete process unless you're also working on the structural issues that cause that to happen, that charity to be needed in the first place. So that's my thinking on, uh, on that issue. So conveniently, I work at the charity that gets the money. So I don't want to say that anybody else's opinion isn't valid, because they are. <laughs> but maybe I'll speak to it from our perspective. So this is the sixth year that did five days for the homeless. Um, over those six years, I, actually, they were standing behind me while I was talking at one point with bouncing their check in the air. They were very excited because they hit 30,000 bucks this year. So um, that event's generated 134 grand for us. and. If you put it in some terms of dollar for dollar costs that happen in the organization, it costs us about two bucks to serve a meal. Um, so if I was to definitively give a cost, that's what, 60, 67,000 meals that puts through our building. I would wager, um, although I can't for sure say this, that the 64,000 people that eat those meals could care less whether or not we did a fundraiser in the owl or not. Um, one of my great frustrations that exists, and this is comes back to like I think a broader conversation. Conversations about homelessness and extreme poverty tend to be, for whatever reason, exceptionally divisive. And I don't really know why uh, that is. There's divisiveness from people who think we shouldn't invest in it. There's divisiveness from groups that think only certain people should be able to speak to it. Um, my perspective is kind of always been, uh, there really isn't, there really isn't something that I look at and think like it's counterintuitive or it's, it's the opposite because I think at its base level I recognize that it's a bunch of 21 and 20 and 22 year old kids trying to raise money for an organization. And people like to raise money doing things like karaoke and lip sync battles. Um, and if that puts money in our organization to provide base level services to uh, the members of our community that need to access those services, 
while we're still engaging the community and other concerned members of our community are working to change policy, I, I don't see, uh, yeah, I don't see the hypocrisy in it, and I also don't think that it's fair to demand that a five-day event that's designed to be a fundraiser somehow accurately portrays every angle or degree of the conversation around homelessness. So my hope would be that we can see, and I think it was your guys' intention, which I think was really great from having a conversation with you earlier in the week, to have these conversations be inclusive, right? So that something like this is very supplementary, something like uh, academia is very supplementary to the fundraising efforts. It's about engaging everybody. And at the end of the day, um, a group of 20 year old kids that maybe don't have a clue about homelessness this week got to meet people from our building that actually are experiencing homelessness and hear their stories. Um, they got to interact actually with a really cool documentary thing that was going on in, in Rick every time we walked by with one of the kids that was participating and, and to interact with the chief that was sitting there and to go through the residential schools exhibit and to really to get context and history to what's going on. And I was at a, an event a while back uh, up in Watchers called Generating Momentum and there was a lady that was speaking and she was saying like as knowledge bearers we have the responsibility to invite people into conversation instead of shaming them for their lack of knowledge. And I think sometimes there's there's too much shaming and not enough inclusion. I mean, there's a balance, right? I'm not just saying like it's all kumbaya, we're gonna sit around the fire and everybody's gonna agree on everything, but like, um, that's my perspective on it. Any other questions? Sure. Uh, um, what I wanted to ask is some of our students live here, um, not just in on campus, but we live outside. Uh, we have our own houses. Um, is there any way that we could maybe help fellow students that are going through a tough time? Is there any process where um, there is screening done for them uh, that it's deemed safe for someone who is 19, 20 in our age group to actually, you know, maybe give them shelter while they don't go and stay at a physical homeless shelter? With, like, is, is there something of that sort that you guys have? Organizations. Sounds like a great project for <laughs> Ursu and our part to work on, though. Students Union does have emergency bursaries, and you can meet with the student advocate to apply for that. So if something happens and you're kicked out of your home, they can give you like some emergency bursary money, or even put you up in residence for a few nights. Um, they help you figure things out. So there is a process in place to support students in crisis. Yeah, good, good question. I appreciate that. Um, I'm not aware of any official needs or agenda. I do, I do have a feeling that that type of program exists in other cities, but I, I just can't point to an example. During my time at Carmen, um, we lined that up a couple times. You know, I had people that were part of the Carmen community, usually people that were, we were very familiar with through volunteering that would get a phone call from somebody. We had a lady in the North End who her husband had passed away, she had a whole big house to herself. And uh, we aligned to sum up who was, was homeless from Carmichael who went to go stay with her. So they were fine. I mean, ultimately, um, if you're going to be a landlord, uh, there's certain, like you kind of have to make that call yourself. I guess there's certain good reasons that sort of thing. But uh, I encourage you to rent your room if you can. We need to remember, too, the vacancy piece actually, it's not, there's not a problem with the number of rooms in Regina. There's lots of rooms in Regina. There's, a, there's not enough addresses. Um, the, average, uh, the average household size in Regina, depending on our neighborhood, is just under or just over two people per house. So there's, uh, there's lots of rooms here. <laughs> Thanks. As a follow up to that, uh, there is the public website, couchsurfing.org, where you can uh, offer uh, your spare bed or couch to anybody who contacts you on the website. And you, it has a referencing system, so you can judge the person's character by their references. We have a question in the back. Yes, I do. I need to like, go to these cases. I got a good question. Based on the amount of people that live in the city that are homeless, what would you recommend other than them using the services to go and eat at, like Souls Harbor and all the other places? That 
So the question is... Based on the amount of money that people get from like social services, not have enough to live on, right. and they go, they go out to go into groceries. If they go and utilize Souls Harbor, and it's a place that I've noticed from my experience, uh -huh. it's like for a bunch of drugs to go there. How would you prevent that? What would you recommend other than places that provide free meals? Sure, I'll touch base on that quickly. Imagine that people have a comment. Um, what people get, if you're in basic social assistance, the rent allotment you get is four fifty five a month. Does anybody here rent? Once or twice? Um, there's not a lot of places for four fifty nine. so what happens is a lot of times, if you're on social assistance, which is not a fringe group of people, there's lots of people who are on social assistance, um, people have to make choices between eating and paying rent and the rest of the world. So, uh, I, I would say actually the, the food front regenerative does not a bad job. I would say there's there could be more coordination as far as like when things are open. I know Carmichael now serves meals on a Sunday, but to find a meal during the week, I think there's quite a few options. It's not to say it works for everyone, but there's quite a few options. To find a meal on the weekend, you do it at St. Uh, St. Paul's downtown, it does it once every other week or something like that. So there could be more coordination as far as food food delivery. Um, we have a, a huge food bank in Regina, actually. Again, keep, keep in mind, food banks were created in the 80s with the idea it was going to be like a temporary thing, and now there's lots of people who legitimately uh, rely on the food bank. And not necessarily people who are assistants. There's uh, I'm not sure if anyone has a sense of knowledge, but there's, there's thousands of people who use the food banks. There's also um, community um, organizations partnerships with several people they have the street survival guides um, and I think there's also there is a group that are I can't think of their official title but they're trying to do like a food assessment on the city to kind of identify those things um, an agency that we often utilize to kind of supplement the food bank and like the free bread programs and free meal programs is reach the and their focus is on food and hunger in Regina uh, they have low like low-cost food grocery stores um, the Salvation Army on like 13th and Lauren. They provide, they also do emergency food hampers on occasion for people. Um, and they, you know, have free bread programs there. I think they have a meal program once in a while as well. Um, so I think there are things out there. Food security is definitely always an issue because you're right, the amount that you get, um, your personal living benefit on social assistance starts at 255 and then if you have disabilities, it'll, it'll go up by small increments. But I mean, it's definitely an issue that we're dealing with and there are agencies that are trying to raise awareness about how much of an issue it is. Um, I know that that probably doesn't fully answer your question and isn't as helpful as you maybe needed it to be, but um, really I'd say work with the agencies, ask questions, and find out where all the food programs are, because there's a few out there. I just don't have them memorized off the top of my head any longer. Uh, a fact is that the food banks in Saskatchewan have seen the largest increase in usage of any food banks across Canada in 2014. It's boom time. Um, there's a couple things coming down the pipe in this community. Uh, they're not immediately here. Like the Corrigy program, that's uh, a really great idea. It's actually going to be done on a bit of a, a bigger scale uh, through an aberrant housing project that's going to be developed in the downtown of Regina. They're going to have a not-for-profit grocery store that's a, a part of that facility. Um, there's also a uh, couple of private partners that have approached us that, I mean, at this point it's, it's dreaming thoughts, but the idea would be to place a similar type of store, not necessarily like housing development, but a store of not-for-profit groceries again into the to the heritage neighborhood as well. So there would be access to, to groceries for folks who have a hard time paying for them on the amount they get from social assistance. Um, yeah, I mean, our food program, we try as much as we can uh, to A, recycle food. So food that would be otherwise disposed is largely what serves our meals. So we get about 54,000 meals out of that and purchasing groceries on our own. 
Um, but we also have a nutrition program that we run that's part of the food security program that supplements it. It kind of rolls um, six week blocks throughout the year. Um, we usually have about maybe 30 different people from the community that participate in it year over year. And it's about learning to both shop for groceries on a budget and to teach people to use ingredients that they might not have had access to previously. So learning how to cook with things that they've never seen before. Um, some people get stuff in a, in a box from a food bank and they just actually don't know what to do with the food. Um, so they dispose of it. Um, we see that with reach. We get reach on a weekly basis in the summer and people grab the things that they're familiar with. Um, but helping to expand people's, I guess I don't know what you call it, like uh, food knowledge or recipe knowledge really changes what somebody can eat and the nutrition that they can get into their homes. So that's another really key thing to note. Um, we have a great partnership with Artberg and the Green Patch over the course of the summer. Uh, they grow a garden here and we're able to provide produce to people. But I mean, the reality of it is, is there's going to be emergency food services as long as um, people's experiences are to the instability of wherever their next meal comes from. And largely, the folks that show up at a place like uh, the Salvation Army for Meal, uh, or us, or the Marion Center, depending on where they're open, uh, it will largely be folks that are uh, facing the challenge of addiction. So, um, you know, I think the, the disproportionate representation of, of folks that have those challenges uh, is going to be reflected in any emergency service that you access in the community. So, uh, I don't know if there's really a way to get around it until we go back to some of these broader concepts that we've talked about, about actually like as a community coming together and making sure folks have the community support they need to overcome those barriers. So. temporal solution. It's not very forward thinking to say, you know, we'll introduce the cold weather strategy for November until the end of April every year and we'll spend like, you know, yeah, 24, 2500 bucks. And that's if they're in shelter. I mean, you're not talking about like a hotel. I mean, those are more money. Uh, you know, people that are using ambulance rides because they're getting found out in snow banks stay in emergency for a couple of weeks at a time. It's not cheap either. But I mean, it comes back to that conversation. I mean, there's, there's strategies that are in place. Housing First is one of the such ones that they're looking to, to roll that in. But um, I mean, uh, it, it, it fits into this weird conversation that I, like I kind of tried to hint at. Uh, sometimes my thoughts don't come out of my mouth the way I'd like for them to, but there's like a, a very bizarre like uh, morality conversation that comes along with something like that. The fact that we are willing as a society, as a province, uh, as a city to invest in uh, emergency programs that actually like continue cycles of instability uh, relates very much back back to how we value the individuals that are, are in our communities. And in a lot of circumstances, I think, not all of us, I don't want to generalize, but I don't know, but the broader community has bought into the narrative that somebody who is valued is somebody who's contributing. Um, and that there's somehow this like narrative of personal responsibility above all else. Whereas I think from our experience, uh, the vast majority of people being empowered to move forward in their personal responsibility comes from shared responsibility and community support. Um, so, you know, like one, I guess, prototypical example of that, two of them actually recently would be, um, we had a couple folks that we housed that like major chronic long-term addictions issues, uh, significant mental illness diagnosis. We got them into housing and we were able to provide these uh, kind of the wraparound supports or comprehensive support. Um, able to kind of help them when they identify that they had a crisis, connect them to proper agencies that would be able to help them access the things that they need. And we had one that was like a very chronic hoarder who would come into the building and just like take a bag of things every time they left. And this person maintained housing for uh, six months and started bringing things back. Because through support in their community, they were able to get to a space where they were like, why am I taking all this crap home? and start bringing it back and having it saying when they bring it back, like, I don't need all this, I'd like to give it to somebody else in need. But it's through like 
working together on that, right? And then, I mean, like, the flip side of it, too, is, like, some people that are going into housing, and it's like, they don't even know how to use a phone. 